Hello, everyone, and welcome to the China Seminar Series hosted by the Australian Center on China and the World here at the ANU. My name is Matthew Galway, a lecturer of Chinese history here at the ANU, and it is my uh, honor and privilege to present Benjamin Penny, who will be our speaker for today. Before we begin, I'd just like to stay, uh, uh, our, stay our acknowledgement of country. Uh, we acknowledge and celebrate the First Nations, the Ngunnawal and Nambri peoples on whose unceded traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Now on to our speaker. Professor Benjamin Penny is Senior Research Fellow at the Australian Center on China and the World and head of the ANU Taiwan Studies Program. His work mainly focuses on Chinese religions, but he's also interested in the Chinese treaty, uh, treaty ports in the mid 19th century and the development of Sinology. His two current projects are a study of a Taiwanese new religion, Wei Xin Sheng Jiao, and a book based on the teenage diaries of Kaliner Alabaster, an English student interpreter in Hong Kong in 1855-56. So without further ado, Benjamin Penny, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, <clears throat> before I go on, I'll just share my screen. Uh, and Oh, look at that. Yes, it is working. There we go. It's that one. Is that clear for everybody? Yeah, good. All right. So I'm going to read this because if I don't, I'll just get horribly lost. And um, yeah, and it'll become garbled. Um, the first thing I should say is that the inverted commas around homosexuality in the title, uh, the reason for that will become clear. So, um, Protestant missionaries from overseas were active in China for almost 150 years, from the beginning of the 19th century until the Communist Revolution. Even before the Treaty of Nanking in 1843, mission societies were preparing for what they saw as China's inevitable opening to Westerners. Thus, missionaries stationed in Malacca, Batavia, and other cities with large Chinese populations in Southeast Asia, as well as in Canton and Macau under the wing of the East India Company, learnt Chinese and began to both translate the Bible and to write tracts and other aids to missionizing. When the treaty ports were opened and Hong Kong was ceded, their numbers grew strongly and Protestant and the Protestant presence in China became substantial. Roman Catholic missionaries had, of course, long preceded the Protestants, Matteo Ricci having arrived there more than 200 years earlier. In the story of Bible translation, however, they played a much smaller role. For theological reasons, it was the Protestants who took the lead in making the Bible available in vernacular languages around the world. The Bible for Protestants, especially in the 19th century, was the very word of God. Even those scholar missionaries who kept up to date with advances in the natural sciences and in linguistics were still what we would call today biblical literalists. It was regarded as vital in their understanding of the relationship of believers to God that all Christians should be able to read God's word in their own language. Thus, the translation of the Bible into Chinese in all its forms and dialects and indeed its publication and distribution were fundamental tasks of the mission. This explains why work on Bible translation and printing began so early in the mission's history. The task of translation was a primary focus of the missionaries, but they were not satisfied when one version had been completed. The translation of Holy Scriptures, Christian and all others, is a form of work that demands extraordinary care. These are not ordinary words. A translation that departs from the literal meaning to better represent the sense of a text is not in this case an available option. Thus, over the 19th and early 20th centuries in particular, translations of the Bible appeared one after the other as missionaries became more and more fluent in Chinese and became aware of inaccuracies and infelicities in earlier versions. In addition, Differences in biblical interpretation between various Protestant denominations led to new translations that reflected those nuances. Most notably, 
Disputes arose over the choice of Chinese terms to translate fundamental biblical notions, famously in the so-called term question, where vast amount of ink were spilled over many decades over what term most correctly translated the word God. Getting it right was therefore of a degree greater in importance in translating the Bible than perhaps in any other translation project. The question of accuracy, though, also had very practical consequences. A Chinese person who had decided to become a believer in Christianity underwent the ritual of baptism to enter the community. Before they could be baptized, however, the presiding missionary had to be satisfied that they had truly accepted the teachings. One of the threshold questions in this context was whether the candidate for baptism had ceased worshipping their ancestors. Indeed, as proof of their conversion, missionaries sometimes demanded the candidate bring their ancestral tablets to the mission to be discarded. Unsurprisingly, this proved too much for many Chinese people for whom ancestor worship was deeply ingrained, or for those whose family members had not converted and refused to give up the tablets. Conversion, therefore, meant behavioral change, as well as change in beliefs. Some behavioral changes were arguably based on scripture, such as the rejection of polygamy, but others like ceasing opium smoking and foot binding were more based on Western ideas of proper conduct. This paper focuses on scriptural injunctions, specifically those passage in the, passages in the Bible that in the teachings of many, if not most Christian churches outlaw homosexuality. Considering these passages, we can observe the conjunction of philology, translation practice, biblical exe exegesis, and behavioral precepts in precise detail. Biblical condemnations of certain behaviors were of paramount importance. For a new, dedicated and sincere convert, it mattered greatly what they were allowed to do, and more particularly, entering a, entering a religion that laid such stress on the concept of sin, what they were not allowed to do. So there are seven passages in the Bible. Oops, where am I going with this? There we are. There are seven pas passages in the Bible that typically are cited by those who claim that the Bible condemns homosexuality. They are four passages in the Hebrew Bible, the story of Noah and his son Ham in Genesis, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis, and two laws in Leviticus. In the Second Testament, there are three, one in Romans, which alone in the Bible mentions homosexual behavior by women as well as men and the two so-called vice lists in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. It is the translation of the two vice lists that is under scrutiny here. There are several reasons for this. First, the Ham and Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah stories are extraordinarily complex, but not in a way that rests on translation questions. There are indeed eminent biblical scholars who maintain that these stories are not in fact about homosexual acts at all. To embark on a discussion of them would take this paper far from its focus. Similarly, scholarly discussions about the two laws in Leviticus do not rest on translation issues so much as on historical understandings of the nature of the ancient Jewish law. In the Second Testament, answering the question of what Paul is, is actually, whether Paul is actually condemning homosexuality or not in his letter to the Romans does not rely on the meanings of words so much as on the structure of Paul's argument and the nature of the Roman religious world of his time. However, the two vice lists in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and his, well, not really his, but we say it's his first letter to Timothy, are uh, a different case. In these, it is the actual meanings of two words Paul uses that is disputed. What exactly was Paul condemning? Thus, by examining the translations of these terms into Chinese, we can ascertain precisely what actions the missionaries and their Chinese partners in the translation project decided were wrong and should not be allowed. 
It's necessary at this point to make a distinction between sexual acts and sexual identity. It is common in contemporary language to ascribe personal identities to sexualities. Indeed, the standard acronym LGBTIQ plus and its variants does exactly this. A certain person is a lesbian or is gay or is bisexual and so on. Their sexuality is part of or even defines their identity. This was not always the case. The English words homosexual and heterosexual only date from the 1890s. Bisexual, as in this case an identity descriptor, appears more than a decade later, and transsexual is from the 1950s. Prior to this time, it was not identities that were being described, but actions. And here I should at least say, it's not exactly a warning, but I want to inform you that in the nature of this paper and in the next sentence, there are certain words which are explicit about sexual acts. Um, so I'm just letting you know that. In this paper, I will cite some Chinese English dictionaries from the 19th and early 20th centuries where words that describe, um, where words that describe certain sexual actions appear. For example, and these are some of the words that appear, sodomy, buggery, self-abuse, masturbation, and pederasty. But we should remember that these words describe things people do. They do not describe a person's identity. A second preliminary discussion involves the process of Bible and other translation throughout the Qing dynasty. It's well known that missionaries as well as diplomats and many other foreigners in China employed teachers who not only taught them Chinese, but also acted as more general informants about Chinese culture, history, mores, etc. How exactly did this work? Fortunately, a detailed description of Bible translation survives in George Smith's A Narrative of an Exploratory Visit to Each of the Consular Cities of China from 1847. Smith at this stage, he was sent by the Church Missionary Society, which was an Anglican society, and later uh, from 1849 to 65, he became the Anglican Archbishop of Victoria, as in Hong Kong, not as in Australia. Smith's book is written in diary style, so we can be exact about the events he described. The following description was written on February the 19th, 1846 in Xiamen, Amoy, and, and concerns the translation, coincidentally, of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians for the version of the Bible known as the Delegates Version. The translation team was led by the London Missionary Society missionary, John Stronach. And I'll read this, it's, I'll give you a, there you are, that's it there. It's rather long, but it is really good. So he says, on this and the following days, I was present at the local committee of translation from half past 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. The three most experienced missionaries were present with their Chinese teachers, one of whom was a literary graduate. A few old men from among the regular attendants on divine worship were also generally present and sometimes entered conversation when any topics of discussion arose. After prayer for the help of the Holy Spirit on the work of making known the word of God in the Chinese tongue, the work of revision commenced at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 5, about 12 verses being accomplished on each day. The original Greek text was first consulted and rendered into its close and literal meaning. Medhurst's Chinese version was then read aloud and being considered on the whole as the best of the previous translations was made the groundwork of the new undertaking. Reference was afterward made to Morrison's Chinese version and occasionally also to that of Gutzlaff, both versions being read aloud when there was any important variation. The missionaries after discussing the passage among themselves and conveying orally the meaning of the sacred text of the Chinese teachers, proceeded to receive the opinion of the latter on its idiomatic expression in the written language. On such occasions, it was sometimes painful to me to witness the mirth and levity with which Morrison's renderings were criticized by the Chinese. The most ridiculous misconceptions being conveyed to their minds by the literal and unidiomatic character of that version. Medhurst's version appeared to be a more free translation than that of Morrison, sometimes being paraphrastic, but generally idiomatic. 
It was esteemed by the natives present as greatly superior in its style of Chinese composition to the other versions extant. Gutslav's version was considered an approximation to that of Methurst, on which, on which it was intended, however, to be an improvement by being more literal. The teachers generally shook their heads as the last two versions were read and appeared almost invariably to prefer that of Medhurst, in which, however, some emendations and corrections were occasionally made. These were noted down by the teachers and a fair copy was afterward made out at their leisure of the renderings as finally approved and adopted by consent of the whole party. I include this rather long description to show how deeply collaborative the translation process was and how involved Chinese scholars were. We can assume, I think, that while one of the three teachers was a literary graduate, probably referring here to the Juren degree, the other two were likely from that large class of learned Chinese men who failed the exam. Secondly, we have confirmation that the translation began with the Greek, with the final Chinese version agreed only after both the Chinese teachers and others present and the missionaries agreed. Thirdly, the translation team consulted with, critically, the Morrison, Gutzlaff and Methurst translations before finalizing their own. Now, as noted above, the two passages in the New Testament that are typically cited to claim that homosexuality is, sin homosexuality is sinful and which will be discussed in this paper are the so-called vice lists found in the letters of Paul. One of these passages is in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, 6 verses 9 and 10. Uh, I've given you, for those who want it, the original Greek, not that I can read it, and three versions um, of standard English translations of different periods, the New International Version and, and the New Revised Standard Versions Contemporary, the King James Version, much older. Um, and I'll just read from the Revised Standard Version, the new one. Do not know that wrongdoers, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. The two terms of interest here are malakoi and asinakoitai, the two Greek words. Clearly, there's no specific meaning on what these two terms actually meant. In the New International Version, they appear to be rendered by the single phrase, men who have sex with men. Okay, men who have sex with men. The New Revised Standard Version says male prostitutes and sodomites. The King James Version says the effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind. This lack of agreement is striking, especially when compared with the consistency of translations of the other vices in the list. As in the English translations, the Chinese render <coughs> renderings in contemporary uh, Bibles of Malachi and Asanakoitoi are not the same. So here are two contemporary Chinese Bibles uh, that are both used amongst Chinese communities now. Uh, the first one, the Revised Union Version, and I'll translate the Chinese terms here, render Malakoi and Asinakoitai as those who engage in prostitution and those who are attracted to male-to-male -male sex. In the Revised Union Version, there's a note added to those who engage in prostitution that reads, the meaning of the original text is a seductive woman. This possibly refers to male temple prostitutes. Now there's a, a large exegetical discussion about male temple prostitutes that I won't go into here, um, but that's what it's referring to. The uh, Chinese contemporary Bible, on the other hand, renders these two words as uh, the first one, deviant or abnormal, and the second as homosexual, um, namely, um, uh, uh, the second passage um, in the New Testament comes from Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 9 verses 9 to 11. And again, you can see it all here. I'll read the uh, 
uh, the new revised standard version. This means understanding. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their mother and father, or father, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Here in Timothy, rather than there being two terms, malakoi and asinokoitai, uh, Paul, or pseudo Paul, only uses the term asinokoitai, only one of them. And in this, the New International Version re renders that as those practicing homosexuality, the New Revised Standard Version, sodomites, and the King James Version, them that defile themselves with mankind. And similarly, uh, with the other translations, the other vices are very consistent. In the Chinese versions, these read in the Revised Union version, those who are attracted to male-to-male -male sex and in the, the um, CCB, the, there we have it there, um, again, homosexual, Tong uh, Xinglian. Again, it's clear that these standard Chinese translations are not in agreement with each other, let alone with all the English ones, about what the, trans the transgressions Paul condemns actually are. There is a good deal of both scholarly and popular discussion over the correct interpretation of these Greek terms. Understandably, as questions of sexuality have become controversial and divisive within Christian churches worldwide in recent decades, um, that's why there's the, the um, so much discussion. The difficulty here, though, lies not in theology, but in philology. Now, uh, a scholar by name Adam L. Wirig, who's researched the translation of this passage in Corinthians uh, in the Europe in the early modern period, puts the issue, philological issue, succinctly. Oh, sorry, this is my summary of, of translations of Malakoi and Asinokoitai in contemporary um, translations into English and Chinese, but I've been through that. And this is Wirig. And he writes this, while most of the malefactors to be excluded from heaven are easily identified in the vice list in 1 Corinthians, the clause, and I won't read that, but it's the one that contains malakoyantus and akoitai, is decidedly ambiguous. In this clause, the apostle Paul presents two words, one of which is vague and has various definitions in koine, which is the style of Greek that was used in the Eastern Mediterranean in Paul's time and a lot longer. So one of them has, is vague and has various definitions in the Koine, while the other is a neologism of the apostles making. Thus, these two terms, one blandly vague and the other hyper-specialized, represent a passage in which great lexical care and consideration must have been required by the Protestant reformers. The vague but commonly used term that Wirig refers to is malakoi. The neologism is asinokoitai. So let's first examine the first term used in Corinthians 1, malakoi. Robert Gnuser, a, a fairly eminent uh, biblical scholar, summarizes the range of meanings this word had in Greek. In the most general terms, it means softness, soft clothing, rich food, gentle breeze, laziness, weakness, moral laxity, and a person who was effeminate, physically soft, or was a sissy, or did not appreciate educational warfare, or had too much sex with women. He says, how ironic. Perhaps the word was used as slang to describe an effeminate person, such as a boy prostitute or a boy slave. In this passage, it might specify a young teenage boy used for sexual purposes, or perhaps at the other end of the spectrum in this passage, it simply may mean debauched individual. Thus, for translators who most fervently wish to be precise, malakoi was a minefield. However, if malakoi was a problem, asenakoitai was even worse. Gnuza observes that, quote, this word does not occur prior to Paul in Greek literature, and that Paul himself may have coined it. 
Needless to say, in recent years, there's been a good deal of discussion and argument about what these words mean, particularly among those who, on my reading, either want to claim that Paul did indeed condemn, condemn homosexuality, or those who want to prove he did not. The issues raised by those scholars, while fascinating and important, at least for Christians, are not of direct relevance here. Rather, this essay seeks to ascertain what translators of the Bible into Chinese thought these terms meant, what terms they used to translate them into Chinese, and how a Chinese person new to Christianity would have interpreted them. Now, for the purposes of this study, I have used some 18 translations into Chinese of the Bible, or relevant parts of it, that date from 1707 to 1919. The earliest translation is the collaboration between Jean Basset, a Mission Étranger de Paris missionary based in Sichuan, and his colleague Johann Xu. Uh, this was the manuscript that found its way to Sir Hans Sloan, and then into the British Museum, where Robert Morrison saw and transcribed it after 1805. So that translation dates, we think, from about 1707, because Basset died in that year and they were still, it's incomplete, they were still doing it. So it ends up, the, the final date is about 1707. This Basset Shu translation was also used by Joshua Marshman, who received a copy from Morrison. Um, the next in order chronologically is that of Louis de Poirot, who died in 1813 who was a Jesuit court painter, as well as a translator based in Beijing, who worked on the Chinese translation in the 1790s. He also incidentally translated the Bible into Manchu. Like the Basset Xu translation, the Poirot one was not published at the time. The first publication, in fact, was only in 2014 and is notable for being in vernacular Chinese. These first two translations, the only ones in my sample that come from Roman Catholic hands. Catholic translation, <clears throat> Catholic um, priests began translation work again in the late 19th century, but the first published Catholic New Testament, that of Joseph Xiao Jingshan, was not published until 1922, with the complete Bible only appearing in 1968. The first Protestant translation was made by Joshua Marshman, a Baptist missionary in Serampore, now part of Kolkata in India, with the aid of a Macau-born Armenian Hoveness Gazarian, usually known as Johannes Lassa. The first two Gospels were published in 1810, the Complete Bible in 1822. The second, much better known and more influential, was that of Robert Morrison, done in Canton. The first published book was Acts in 1810, followed by the Gospel of Luke, 1811, and Paul's Letters in 1812. The whole of the New Testament was completed by 1813, and the entire Bible published in 1824. These Protestant translations heralded a century of revisions, new versions, and denominational squabbles. I won't outline all of these versions here, except to note that they were not translated, not all translated into the same register of Chinese. Most were in what we would call literary or classical Chinese, which was often called Hai Wenli at this time. Somewhere in a simplified version of this language called Easy Wenli. A third category was closer to the vernacular, namely Mandarin or Guanghua, and translations were made into both the Beijing and Nanjing versions of it. Apart from the Catholic and Protestant translations, there was one produced by the Russian Orthodox Archimandrite Grigory Platonovich Karpov, who was head of their mission in Beijing from 1858 to 64, better known as Guri. This translation was from the Slavonic and was completed in 1864. This brief survey closes with two versions of the so-called Union version, the Hohoban, from the early 20th century. The Union version was an attempt to create a translation that would gain the adherence of all Protestant denominations. This attempt was largely successful. The Union version was published in different versions of Chinese and has since been revised. The revised Union version that I quoted above was completed in 2010. So I'm now going to move here to show you, I'm not going to leave this up because I want to move on to other things. This is a table 
of all the translate 18 translations I've used with on the left, the Chinese name of the translation. So for instance, the Basit Xu was the Bai Xu, Bai being the family name in Chinese of Jean Basset. Uh, uh, the second column, obviously the date it came out, the name of the public, the translation as it's usually given in English language sources, and then the Chinese rendering of verse uh, nine of chapter six of the first letters of the Corinthians. Now, I don't expect you to whiz through all of those quickly, but nonetheless, I'm going to move on. This is the same thing for the first book of Timothy, chapter one, verse 10, all the different translations there. And here is a, a chart, which I will leave up for a bit, where I've extracted the particular translations of the words that we're concerned with here, the two Greek words, malakoi and, and asinokoitai. The first column and the second column are the two, are the, the way they appear in one Corinthians translation. And the third column is how it appears in one Timothy. And on the left are the various names of the translations. So let us begin with the word malakoi and how it was translated. In the list of translations given in this table, we find that the renderings of Malakoi fall into three groups with one kind of outlier. The first four translations chronologi chronologically give either zin or shose. Both of these words are rare. Indeed, I can't find any reference for zin as a standalone term. The only reference I can find for shose as a term in the appropriate semantic field comes from a dictionary printed by the Lazarus, the Catholic Lazarus mission in Peking in 1895, the Dictionnaire Phonétique Chinois Français, where the entry reads, Chu, uh, Shu, Se, uh, sorry, Shou, Se, with the characters, with the definition, masturbation. However, by at least 1913, Shou Yin, a combination of both terms, appears as an equivalent for masturbation in an English Chinese dictionary produced by the commercial press in Shanghai, as it also does in a German English dictionary from 1920. Shou Yin was actually used consistently through the Republican period in psychological and medical works as evidenced by the sources referred to by Frank Dicotter in his Sex, Culture and Modernity in China. Thus, we can safely conclude that these four early translations regarded malakoi as meaning masturbation. The fact that this rendering was superseded by the Medhurst Gutzlaff translation of 1837 and did not again appear can be accounted for by the nature of and interrelationships between these first four translations. We know that Morrison and Marshman Lassar both used the Basse Shu translation of 1707 and that Basset and Poirot were both Roman Catholics. While it's probable that both priests knew Greek and possibly had access to Greek Bibles among their books in China, they would have undoubtedly have been very familiar with the Vulgate Latin version of the scriptures. In this latter version, Malakoi was translated as moles, which has most of the broad range of connotations as Malakoi. However, Catholic authorities as eminent as the uh, 13th, 14th century uh, um, theologians, Thomas Aquinas and Nicholas of Lyra, regarded Mollus as referring specifically to masturbation. I suspect that this is the tradition of translation that we see reflected in these four early Chinese Bibles. The Medhurst Gutzlaff translation of 1837 is the only one to use the term Bishingren for Malakoi. Fortunately, we can determine exactly what the translators meant by this term, as it appears in Methurst's own dictionary of 1848, as one of the definitions of catamite, though without the final ren person. The other equivalent given in that dictionary is Bitong, which makes the age of the catamite explicit, Tong, veering clearly towards the first of the option, op options in the OED definition of catamite, a boy, that's the, what it is, or young man, who is made use of as a, typically, as a typically passive sexual partner by an older man. 
Herbert Giles is even more explicit, giving a definition of both Bixing and Bipong as catamite or pathic. The OED defines the rare word pathic, P-A-T-H-I-C, as, quote, a man or boy who is the passive partner in homosexual anal intercourse. The term Bixing is very old, with literary references going back to the later Han, at least, but had the sense for much of his history of, of a favorite, for example, of a high-ranking man, and actually often referred to women. This single instance of Bixing for Malakoy heralded in an equivalent term that held sway for the rest of the 19th century, namely Luantong. By the early 20th century, the commercial press dictionary could give both Bitung and Luantong as translations of catamite. The Luantong appears to go back into Chinese literary history as far as the Southern dynasties appearing in Yutai Xinyong, the new songs from a jade terrace. It became rather more common in the later imperial period, especially from the late Ming. After this time, it became one of the standard terms for catamite and appears in, for instance, Liao Jai Zhiri in this sense. <clears throat> The final term found only in Chalmers and Schaub's 1897 translation and in the Easy Winley Union version is Rolsier. This translation choice is fascinating as at least in my searches, it was a genuine neologism. The term actually does appear in a completely different sense in commentaries to the 43rd hexagram Guai in the I Ching, but that's a completely different kettle of fish. I suspect in, that in this translation, the translators were attempting to broaden the meaning of their equivalent to Malakoy by rendering it more literally, that is, as soft. We might think of Rossier then as, quote, the depravity of softness, or, quote, the evil of softness, pointing to a common translation into European languages in the early modern period that rendered Malakoy as effeminacy, or its equivalents. We can be fairly certain, however, as to what the translators thought Rossier should connote. Since the High Wenli translation maintains, maintains the translation of Malakoy as Luantong, and one of the cases of Rossier appears in the easy Wenli version of the Union version, that is related to that, uh, the High Wenli translation maintains Malakoy as Luantong, so we can safely assume that the easy Wenli version should mean the same thing namely catamite. So although they're using a different word, Rossier, the core meaning, the actual meaning of it is probably the same. I'd like now to move on to the other term, Asanakoitai, which is um, a, a slightly more complex. Translations of Asanakoitai revolve around two phrases with one or two outliers. The first phrase found in the earliest translations up to that of Medhurst and Gutzlaff in 1837, and then periodically up to Griffith John's translation of 1886 is nan se, or close variants. It might be tempting to read nan se as simply meaning male to male sex. And indeed in 19th century Chinese English dictionaries, it does seem to have at least this meaning. Medhurst and Giles, for example, give it as an equivalent for sodomy. Logscheid, that's an 1864, I think, uh, dictionary. On the other hand, broadens its uses as a translation of sodomy, buggery, and pederasty, as does the commercial di press dictionary I mentioned earlier. It's worth bearing in mind that the contemporary accepted edition of definition of sodomy as anal intercourse is in fact rather narrower than it was in earlier times, including the 19th century. The OED gives this definition. Formally, any form of sexual intercourse characterized as unnatural or immoral or otherwise culturally stigmatized. Later, any of a number of forms of sexual intercourse other than heterosexual vaginal intercourse, especially as legally defined. To this definition is added the note. The definition of sodomy in criminal law has varied over time and from one jurisdiction to another. Anal and oral intercourse, sexual activity between men, same-sex sexual activity of any kind and bestiality have all been included. Less specific definitions identifying sodomy simply as a quote, crime against nature have also been used. So thus 
Medhurst and Giles's understanding of sodomy as definition of non sir may well have been broader than at first it appears. There is another history of non sir however, that may be of importance in the context of this paper. Or perhaps this would be better put as a history of non shoku, the Japanese reading of these characters. In Japan, at least from the Edo period, this term was used extensively for male to male sex almost exclusively between an old man and a youth, that is pederasty, including in Shunga illustrations. Um, and of course, much Japanese terminology came to China in the 19th century. We should bear this in mind in relation to the following discussion. The other term, apart from nansu, used to translate as an akoita is bi wantong, which you'll find in the list. The locus classicus of this unusual phrase is the instructions of Yi, the Yi Shun, from the collection of texts, denominators being from the Shang dynasty in the book of documents, the Shu Jing. The instructions of Yi is a short text traditionally ascribed to Yi Yin, the advisor to Tang, in the founder of the Shang dynasty, written to give advice on rulership to Tang's grandson Tai Jia. Tai Jia had gained the throne when Yang after the death of Tang and his two sons. Bi Wantong appears in a section of direct speech ascribed to the former king, the Xianwang, namely Tang, addressing those who were in authority, your way. Do I have this? Yes, I do. And this is from the leg translation. If you dare to have constant dancing in your palaces and drunken singing in your chambers, that is called sorcerer's fashion. If you dare to set your hearts on wealth and women and abandon yourselves to wandering about or to hunting, that is called the fashion of dissipation. If you dare to condemn the words of the sages to resist the loyal and upright, to put far from you the aged and virtuous, and to be familiar with procacious youths, that is called the fashion of disaster. Oh, oh sorry, of disorder. If a king were to do any of these things, Ian asserts, their state would be ruined. And moreover, any minister who did not seek to correct his king in these matters should be, quote, punished with branding. Legg's translation of biwantong is, quote, to be familiar with procacious youths. Procacious is not a misprint for precocious, but means, according to the OED, insolent or arrogant in attitude or tone, forward, cheeky, provocative. This does little to render the ambiguity of Legg, to reduce the ambiguity of Legg's rendering. However, his annotation makes things a little clearer. Um, and here it is, to be familiar and keep company with. Wan is paraphrased by obstinate, stupid, and shameless. And then he says, the case of Rehoboam with the counsel of the Solomon and his own young companions will occur to most readers. So Rehoboam is perhaps less familiar to today's readers than he was in Legs time. So this reference requires glossing. <clears throat> Rehoboam was Solomon's son and successor as the king of an ancient united Israel. However, following a rebellion that took place in 932 to 31 BCE, his rule was restricted to the kingdom of Judah in the south. At his coronation, there were two sets of advisors, the councils of, councillors of Solomon, his father, and also his own young companions in Legs' words. Foolishly ignoring the older men, Rehoboam presided over a period of misrule that angered God. And this is from the text. Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed, more than all that their ancestors had done. For they also built for themselves high palaces, pillars, and sacred poles on every high hill and under every green tree. There were also male temple prostitutes in the land. <clears throat> they committed all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Thus, in a roundabout way, Leg points to his, quote, to be familiar with procacious youths as actually referring to sexual relations between adult men and male youths, <clears throat> particularly as he refers uh, male prostitutes. W.H. Medhurst Sr. translated the Shu Jing before Leg in 1846 and is a little clearer in his rendering of the phrases under consideration. Note that Medhurst included the original characters as an aid to learning the classical language. 
So we have B and cultivate, cultivate intimacies with one refractory Tung Yus, uh, which might be consoled, cons called disorderly manners. We can see here that legs to be familiar with is rendered by the less coy cultivate intimacies with, though his refract refractory, obstinate, stu stubborn, unmanageable, rebellious, is still somewhat timid. I might note here the influence of the Chinese teachers helping in the translation. To read or to hear some Greek and have it explained by a bunch of Western missionaries, and then immediately to think that the best rendering of this is an obscure phrase from the Shu Jing certainly points to the kind of people who were employed to be Chinese teachers. Both Leg and Medhurst acknowledge the importance of the commentary to the Shu Jing of the Southern Song scholar Tsai Shen. And again, they wouldn't have known about Tsai Shen except for the learned teachers they had. The only comment in that commentary relevant to the present discussion is his gloss on B, namely B Ni, yeah, B is equivalent to Ni, to become intimate with. To conclude this discussion, B Wang Tung might be glossed in its original context as to become intimate with youths. Indeed, in many dictionaries, Wang Tung is glossed as being the definitional equivalent to Luan Tung, both therefore meaning something like catamites. <clears throat> So far, I've examined the translations of Malakoy and Esenokoitai separately, partly because one Timothy only has the latter term. However, considering these two terms together, it becomes clear that the missionary translators saw them as a pair, at least from Goddard and Lloyd's translation of 1853. It's worthwhile now, therefore, to move on from the specific terms involved to examine the verbs used in conjunction with them. From 1853, Luantung is almost always preceded by a zuo or a wei, and wantung by xia, bi, or qin. The zuo in the way of the first case, I would gloss as to do the activity of, to perform the function of, or even to play the role of. The xia, bi, and qin in the latter two cases means to be familiar, become familiar with, but the xia is rather more explicit in its condemnation, perhaps to become wrongly familiar with. Of course, given that these terms occur in a vice list, as opposed to say a virtue list, the B and Chin must also carry this connotation of wrong behavior. What becomes clear in this discussion is that translators of the Bible in China often, at least post 1837, saw the two vices examined in this paper as a pair. That is Malakoi and Asanakoitai were considered to be the passive and active agents in homosexual intercourse. The catamite and the person who was, quote, wrongly familiar with the catamite. In one translation noted in this paper, such a pairing was made explicit by translating the two vices by a single phrase. The new international version into English, they became men who have sex with men. That's both of them are put together. To make this conclusion specific, it's my contention that as far as we're able to tell, by far, for by far the majority of translations of the Bible, translators of the Bible in China in the 19th century, Paul did not condemn homosexual acts as such. And he certainly did not condemn committed relationships between men. Rather, he condemned homosexual sex between grown men and boys or youths. To be clear, I'm not here making any claim about what Paul actually meant. This is a conclusion about how Paul's terms were translated and what they can tell us about how these translators understood Paul's words. Finally, what would a Chinese person reading the vice lists have thought these words referred to? In other words, what actions might they have, might they have to give up to be a proper Christian? Sexual desire directed at boys or youths was certainly present in late imperial China. One of the texts that is most, it is most often cited in this respect is the auto epitaph of the late Ming essayist Zhang Dai. He died in 1684, in which he admits to have been fond as a young man of, and I quote, exquisite houses, pretty servant girls, 
beautiful catamites, he uses the term Luantong, fine and extravagant clothes, gourmet food, thoroughbred horses, brilliant lanterns, fireworks, drama, music, flowers, and birds. Relationships, or at least liaison, between men and boys, especially boy actors who played female roles on stage, are a common feature of novels, stories, and drama during the last centuries of the imperial era. One observer of Beijing in the mid Qing remarked that there are song boys, but no courtesans. And another noted that, quote, the business leaders and wealthy officials are all infatuated with boy actors and have little left for understood female prostitutes. At the end of the Qing, if any of the memoirs of Sir Edmund Backhouse, published as La Decadence Manchu, are to be believed, brothels staffed by boys were commonplace. However, even if we do not credit Backhouse, there are much more sober witnesses. Sidney Gamble and John Stuart Burgess, both working for the YMCA and conducting surveys in China, reported in 1921 that legalized houses of sodomy <coughs> used principally by the decadent Manchu nobility were conducted in Peking prior to the revolution in 1911, but since then have been abolished. It's therefore safe to presume that a Chinese readership would have had little problem recognizing what the translations of Paul's letters indicated was forbidden. And I'll finish there. Thank you very much.